Thank you, Bob. Appreciate that uh, rousing introduction. Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, union members, coalition members, community groups, and also heard there was a lunch here today. Snuck in. Um, as Bob said, my name is Patrick Welch. I'm a member of the Communication Workers of America for 41 years, local 1101, very proud dues paying member. Um, I started in 1970, worked for the phone company, working in manholes in Lower Manhattan uh, when the Trade Center was going up, and I helped actually run some cables into that building. Um, so I grew up in the South Bronx and Castle Projects, go to projects. My father was an immigrant from Scotland who was a uh, miners' helper when he left Scotland at 18, and he came over here and made my, my and made our family uh, very union-minded. I attended a parochial school. And when it was time to sell chance books, you know how the Catholics are, is always looking for an extra buck. When it was time to sell chance books for the church, my father would always check them. The first thing he would do would be to check them to see if there was a union label on them, make sure they were printed in a union shop. And I remember one time when they weren't that um, they had actually had to do a reprint because he went to the parish meeting and brought it up and, made, and shamed them right in front of everybody. So. Uh, give you an idea where I'm coming from. So, um, but that actually put me in good stead with the nuns the next day, as you can imagine. <laughs> it wasn't like I was with them bad enough as, the, as in the beginning as it was. So I started with the phone company and I quickly realized that he was right, that uh, union was the way to go. And when I was 18, I volunteered for Bobby Kennedy's presidential campaign. Believe it or not, yeah, I'm that old. And, uh, but as you know, he was assassinated in June of 68, just two months after Dr. King. I really believed I could change things through policies, but this was really getting discouraging. But giving up was not an option. <clears throat> Around that time, I saw in the Village Voice, when the Village Voice was actually a good newspaper, I saw in the Village Voice that Cesar Chavez was speaking down at Hunter College, or the president of the United Farm Workers. And I wanted to go hear him so hear what, I, what he had to say, and I introduced myself to him after the speech. I jumped up on the stage. I walked up to him because he was just standing there after the speech, and I said, I introduced myself, I said, how are you doing? And he says, I said, I'm really um, impressed by what you're doing, and I've been reading about you, this is great. And he goes, that's fine and great, uh, could you give me a ride to the airport? I said, sure. So we became good friends, and uh, I, was able to see how, I was able to see how the farm workers uh, uh, organized, and, and particularly used door-to-door -door grassroots campaigning, uh, and, and the U.S. graduate campaign and many different uh, other strategies in order to win, and I saw how he was able to organize, and, and I learned a lot from him, and I saw grassroots work in the labor movement with politics as an opportunity to really talk to people about issues. Sitting in someone's living room is really the best way to do things, or sticking your foot in the door while they're in their robe is another way of doing it, too. <laughs> so, but you get to talk to them face to face and talk about issues with them, which is fantastic. But I stayed involved in the democratic politics because there really wasn't anywhere else to go. But I became a delicious uh, dis disillusion with both parties, particularly in Albany. And once the Conservative Party helped put Pataki in office by oh, just 300,000 votes, I knew it was time for our own party. I want, the once great Liberal Party had become corrupt. The new party would have to replicate the farm workers in some way and emphasize, emphasize grassroots organizing. In 1998, the minimum wage was a perfect example of both parties in Albany not being able to get anything done for working people. The Democrats would vote to raise it, the Republicans would vote against it, and the Democrats would throw up their hands and say, we did what we could, and they would go home and sit on their couch and watch television. <coughs> and I would say to them, it's nice that you voted for it, but you're not doing anything about it. Why aren't you going over to the Republicans and embarrassing them about the fact that they just voted against the minimum wage, which at that time was only $5.15 an hour, the same as the national minimum wage. They voted with good intentions, but had no real love for the fight, or the people who needed them. When the union approached me to start this new party, I thought it was exactly what we needed. I went to an early meeting down in the basement of Unite Local 159. Quite a few people were there. It was definitely a challenge for former party at first. People had their own individual issues. They wanted to talk about, we needed to come together with a united agenda, a unified agenda. I always said that um, the, grave, the graveyards are full of progressive movements in this country that try to be everything to everybody. And it doesn't work that way. You have to pick out your issues 
you have to fine tune them and you have to zone in on them. And if you want to do all the stuff, if you've got a coalition and you want to do other thing outside the coalition, that's the way it should go. But you've got to pick your, your issues and you've got to go after them. And you've got to stick with them so other people won't be able to divide us. Once we divided, once we decided how to move forward, we needed, we needed to collect signatures to get on the ballot in New York State. I went out to collect petitions in the Bronx. I did call city because it's a very union area. I figured that would be easy. And I brought two big, gigantic telephone linemen with me. They were huge guys. And we stood out there in the, in the heat and in the cold, and we collected signatures as, as many hours as we could. And we weren't alone. The party uh, needed about uh, needed 15,000 signatures, which is not a lot. But we went out and all of a sudden done, we collected 60,000 signatures because we knew the Liberal Party, which we were gunning for, knew, we knew that they were going to challenge every single one of our signatures. So we needed to get much more than enough. But getting votes on the, on the ballot line was another issue, though. We needed 50,000 votes to qualify to keep our line. On election night 98, they told us that we were short by 6,000. Man, I mean, you know, after you do all this work, we come up with like 44,000 votes. And we thought that was it. I, th I was thinking we got to wait another four years. So, you know, we just, I went back to my old depression. And just <laughs> hung out for a little while and went back to work. But then I found out that uh, through, the, through the office, I found out that they were still counting in all the other small areas, especially upstate and all the small towns. And they were counting a lot of third party, because many times a lot of third party uh, ballots are put with the main party, and they have to separate them months afterwards. So it turned out we had 51,000 votes and change. And we, we <laughs> so we started to build a party. And it wasn't easy though. People on the street were skeptical of a brand new party they had never heard of. We had to talk to them about workers' issues that they cared about. When we started to become successful, we had outsiders like the liberal and conservative parties trying to take us over infiltrating our party in order to use our name for their agenda. And even many union folks were skeptical. They figured it was a wasted vote until we explained how it worked, how we added votes to our candidate, to our line, and many, many cases made a difference in the election. And the workers started to actually get the idea. We had been Democrats all our lives. Of course, some of them were Republicans and still are. But we convinced them that they could vote for our candidates without pulling either the Democrat or the Republican line and they could vote for the working candidate, for the working party's people candidate. I had, no, I had to convince them it was about getting more strength, using the political arena as another weapon in our arsenal, not only a weapon, but a very effective one. Uh, during the Hillary Clinton campaign in 2000, we went around the whole state and talked about economic issues, told people no one was trying to, to take their gun away. We're not trying to take your gun away. And, and it was difficult because, you know, uh, Hillary Clinton was, upstate New York is a rather conservative area, as most of you know. And Hillary Clinton wasn't exactly going to be Im immediately received well. But she played it smart, she went out there early, and she concentrated on the upstate area, and she went to most of the towns and, and the cities up there and talked to them. And we went also. And I would go up there and talk to our members in CWA, and I would say to them, you need to vote your paycheck. You need to vote. And they get paid every Thursday, most telephone people. And I say, you gotta, you got to think about every Thursday when you're voting. You know, you don't think about the gun. Don't think about the two guys down, down the block who are kissing in their living room. That means nothing to you. It means absolutely nothing to your paycheck at the end of the day. And that's what I, we finally got through to them. And they started realizing that they were voting against themselves on a regular basis. Every time they, they, they were distracted by this other issue with guns or many of the other things that they were brought up by the Republicans. So, as Eugene Debs once said, it is better to vote for what you want and not get it than to vote for what you don't want and get it. And, and, and that's exactly what a lot of workers were doing. They were voting for stuff that they didn't want without realizing and actually getting it. So we worked hard, we were successful, we broke over 100,000 votes that year. People realized the thing isn't going away. We brought new people into the field. In 98 we were scrambled but, uh, but didn't really build a successful form of upstate and downstate. But by 2000 we really had, we had it. We had to figure out how to get downstate and upstate to figure out how we could work together. For the most part the coalition of 98 and 2000 has grown, stayed healthy, matured. The majority of union people have heard of the party. A good number of my people vote on the line everywhere, every time now, uh, in, in, since 2004. We finally got Albany to raise the minimum wage in 2004, and making no mistake, that 
that happen because of our work. The Working Families Party. People who see the party as a chance to express themselves on economic and social issues at the ballot box or the ballot computer, while still fighting in other ways to better the lives of all New Yorkers. The future of the party and New York is in this room. In spite of the present political climate, I feel confident that people in this room can make a difference. Like everyone else, there are times when I get discouraged, but when I meet some of the young people who work for the party, they make me feel really old, actually. No. <laughs> No, I feel like I'm 18 again working for Bobby Kennedy. And I think the future is going to be okay. And I think while Obama was in Chicago having the audacity to hope, I was doing the same thing when I was 18. But now I'm just hoping for audacity. And I think that audacity is in this room. And I don't want you to have, I'm not hoping for you to have audacity, to have more hope. I'm, having, I'm hoping that you'll have audacity to actually do something, to actually go out and challenge these people, and stand up to them, and stop somebody who's getting a $250,000 tax cut January 1st while they're closing senior yeah. citizens in New York City. Yeah. The audacity to go out and do something which Mr. Obama does not seem to have. The audacity to actually go out and make a change and stand up to President Obama and anybody else who says that it's okay to give the rich a tax cut while they cut Medicare, while they cut Social Security. Social Security is not even in the budget, it shouldn't even be talked about. While they cut all these other things, keep taking care of their friends. Bobby Kennedy said progress is a nice word, but change is its motivator, and change has its enemies. There's always a way of getting around someone, something done. You might be blocked one way, but sometimes you have to go back up and go all right. You always will find another way. The powers that will be always will be accommodating us and giving us a new thing to fight for. They're always trying to take away what we already won, and they're trying to stop us from getting us what we deserve. Don't let them. Thank you.